Hi, so we're gonna talk about SIBO here. SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. And what that means is that bacteria that normally reside in the large intestine make their way up the digestive tract into the small intestine where they're not usually found at all or in large numbers. And even benign bacteria such as lactobacillus and bifidobacteria has been found to be sometimes the culprit. There are more pathogenic types of bacteria that reside in the small intestine that can cause a more severe type of SIBO. So, so what is SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth? Well, the simplest way to describe what SIBO is is through conditions or symptoms. So a patient may complain of um, a history of celiac disease or gluten intolerance, connective tissue diseases like scleroderma, Crohn's disease, diabetes, hypothyroidism, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is the autoimmune version, um, ulcerative colitis, IBS, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, uh, obesity, rosacea, even forms of muscular dystrophy and Parkinson's has been associated with SIBO. Um, and even abdominal surgery, uh, gastrectomies, and also past traumas, food poisoning, traveling where you're eating different food, water, bacteria of that region. And so someone may come back from a long trip with all of a sudden uh, gastrointestinal distress and other problems, whether it's from a bacterial change or an amoeba, you know, traveler's diarrhea, parasites, etc. If you suspect that you've had the following symptoms or SIBO-like condition, you would also experience um, bloating, excessive gas after eating, such as belching and flatulence, you know, um, the need to rush to the bathroom after eating. So IBS stands for irritable bowel syndrome. So those are the patients that are used to always having to know where a bathroom is. They're nervous about getting in a car or traveling or even on their way to work because they never know when it will hit them. Um, then the other flip side of that would be constipation. So these patients can go more than three days without a bowel movement and that of course is not normal either. So there's different ways of testing SIBO. There's the breath testing. They have the one hour or the three hour breath test. The breath testing is looking for whether the patient has the hydrogen type or the methane type. There's actually patients that have tested positive for both. Lately, there's been some controversy about does SIBO even exist? Are, are breath tests even positive uh, no matter what? Well, we're still learning a lot about SIBO. I don't think there's a definitive answer yet. However, many people test negative on the hydrogen and methane breath tests and they don't have GI distress or complaints. Other people test positive and once you treat them, they have a resolution of symptoms and feel back to normal. So what is that? Well, luckily there are breath testing available and there's also stool testing available to actually look and see what bacteria is colonizing the gut because that does come out in the stool. Um, here's some interesting facts. Um, SIBO has been found in over 80% of IBS patients um, and may be the main cause of IBS. So if you've been diagnosed for IBS, I mean, what is that really saying? Irritable bowel. Okay, so you have an irritable bowel, but it's not really saying why. Um, and then of course, we are now seeing a relationship with other autoimmune conditions. And um, of course, people with SIBO may have weight loss or weight gain. Um, they tend to get worse on grains, dairy, sugars, and fermentable foods. So you may have heard of um, high FODMAP foods or low FODMAP foods. Well, ha that has to do with the fermentable sugars in those foods. There's oligosaccharides, monosaccharides, disaccharides. So when one has been diagnosed with SIBO, they tend to follow or do better on a low FODMAP diet, low fermentable sugar diet. And so getting back to the testing, um, with breath testing, um, the three hour breath test is the one I usually recommend. And that's the person that is complaining of nausea, belching, vomiting, bad breath, heartburn, gastroesophageal reflux disease or GERD, uh, maybe a history of H. pylori or they need to be tested for H. pylori because they have constant abdominal pain and bloating, especially if they didn't have it before. Side note, 
Antacids can make the problem worse or could even be the underlying cause of the problem. We know Zantac has been pulled off the market, but we've known for a long time that PPIs or proton pump inhibitors and antacids um, are never a good idea because we have stomach acid for a reason to fight certain bacteria and things that should not be allowed to pass into the gut. Dr. Sherry Rogers has a great book out about um, how to treat the gut. She's a traditional medical doctor and I very much recommend that book. Um, so if patients are interested in looking into testing for that, there's two, two labs I like. I like Neurofauna, N-E-U-R-O-V-A-N-N-A. -N -N -A. You can check out their website. I also like Genova Diagnostics. You can check out their website. Um, and that is the first thing I recommend for patients as far as testing. The other interesting thing is the relationship to the neuroendocrine system. So serotonin and dopamine can be affected as well. So if you've ever heard the term, oh, the gut is the, the second brain or trust your gut, trust your intuition. Well, the, the gut does interact and create and, and involve serotonin. Side note on that as well, uh, my patients with hormonal imbalances that may have hot flashes and their primary doctor or OB may have put them on an SSRI uh, and traditional antidepressant and it helps with hot flashes and they're like, why are they putting me on an antidepressant? Well, because that SSRI has receptors in the gut, by the way, and that actually reduces 70% of hot flashes. Well, when you have bacteria in the gut that can create serotonin or deplete serotonin, it can make hot flashes worse. Plus, with hormonal imbalance with the patient that's estrogen dominant and progesterone low, they'll have slower gut motility and the food tends to move slower and is more fermentable. And so entering the perimenopausal years could also trigger, trigger SIBO conditions. So besides testing SIBO, I do like to test hormones and there's neuroendocrine testing as well. So looking at serotonin and then some of the catecholamines like dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, cortisol. Um, so adrenal health and thyroid play a role as, role as well. You know, in naturopathic medicine and integrative medicine, we've always said everything affects everything and always treat the gut. We've been taught that decades ago in naturopathic medicine, but now it looks like the general medical community is recognizing how important that is. So if you're interested in talking more about your symptoms and what path we should take in testing and discussing it, um, just click the book now button on our website. Thank you.